we heard from everyone that living beyond 100 is definitely possible. And I'd like to bring up an author of the book 100 Plus to talk about what that world is going to look like. Without further ado, Sonia Arison. So has anyone here read my book 100 Plus? Oh, this is great. Some hands up in the audience. Um, here it is behind me. Uh, so this presentation is based on that book. And that book was essentially um, my thoughts around, you know, what will the world look like when people can live a lot longer in a healthier state? So what will the world look like when we can live to be 150 years old? Um, but before I go into that, uh, you know, I always like to start this discussion with something personal. And this is a, this is a photo of my grandfather, uh, who's almost 102. He turned 102 this February, born in 1913. Um, and uh, you know, he was born the same year that vitamins A and D were discovered. It wasn't until 15 years later that vitamin C was isolated. He has seen so much change in his lifetime. I mean, he's a, he was a Top Gun instructor in World War II. Um, and the thing I like the most about him is that he's always looking towards the future. At his 100th birthday party, he got up and gave a 20-minute speech. And one of the first things he uh, said uh, when he started out was, um, you know, I can't wait to see what the next 100 years looks like. And he was sort of joking. <laughs> so he's counting on the scientists in this room and a lot of the other people who are really looking towards extending healthy uh, life expectancy um, because he actually does want to see what the next 100 years look like. And I would love to see him do that. Uh, so he's incredibly ambitious, uh, but he's not rare. And so you can see from this chart that um, even just in this short snapshot of time, 30 years, um, centenarians have been growing. And, uh, in 1900, it was estimated that there were only 15,000 centenarians in the U.S. By 2050, it's predicted that there'll be 600,000. And that's based on today's technology. And everyone here knows, you know, here we are in, uh, you know, next to Silicon Valley, technology does not remain static. It changes. And so before we get into that, let's take a look at a little bit of a history. Um, this is probably humanity's greatest achievement. We've managed to move average life expectancy from 18 years up to 80 years in this country. It's higher than that in other countries. You know where the US stands right now on the international um, level? We clock in at number 42. There are 41 countries that have a higher life expectancy than us, which I know is quite shocking. Um, and there's a number of reasons for it, but I won't go into that now. Uh, <clears throat> but we could be doing better. But in any case, th this is you know, what we've managed to do. And some people look at this chart and they say, oh, it's very misleading because, you know, the reason why the chart started going up at the beginning is because we weren't being eaten by animals and we managed to um, battle infectious diseases and you know, antibiotics were invented. And there are all these things, the low-hanging fruit, and that's why it's going up. But you know what? We're going to hit a ceiling now. Not so. The reason why the chart continues to go up in the second half of the 20th century is because things that scientists have managed to do that kill us near the end of life like battling cancer and diabetes and managing those things. We haven't you know, fixed them or cured them yet. Um, hopefully those things are on their way. Technology is going to get better. And as we just saw, um, there's a lot of smart people working on the problem. Uh, I first got interested in this subject uh, because biology has now become an engineering project. I was loving the conversation we just had um, a minute ago where you know, somebody said, uh, you know, we're going to crack the code. And basically, these are people who are trying to hack the human body. And that's what Silicon Valley hackers. How hackers have been tinkering with things for a long time. And so why not the human genome? Uh, and so I first got interested in this, in this topic area because uh, you know, back in 2003, I went over to a friend's house, which, who was sort of a, this hacker type. And he had all these intro to biology books scattered all over his living room. I thought that was a little weird, and I sort of said, you know, what, are you going for a career change or something? And he just looked at me and said, no, Sonia, today I'm hacking computers. Tomorrow I'm going to be hacking biology. And that was sort of an aha moment for me that I actually better start looking into this because it's pretty cool. Uh, so how do scientists hack uh, DNA today, gene therapy? It's not that targeted, I mean, viral vectors and maybe zinc fingers and CRISPR and all that kind of stuff, but it will get better over time. And, you know, some people listen to this and they say, oh, well, you know, the first draft of the human genome was sequenced in the year 2000. 
It's 2014 now. It's been 14 years. We got the human blueprint, and what has it given us? Anything? Well, that's the wrong attitude to take, and this is why it's the wrong attitude to take. Because the human genome was really, really expensive to sequence in the beginning. I mean, it was $2.7 billion. And you can see from this chart um, that progress in genomics is moving faster than Moore's Law, which is extremely impressive. I mean, you know, 100 million, 10 million, dropped it down to 1 million, 100K. You know, now we're down at the $1,000 genome. Illumina announced it this year, and before that, Oxford Nanopore in the UK um, said that they were doing it. And so um, now there's finally the ability for people who actually want to look at reading genomes and gathering big data and looking at the code to actually look at it. Now, we can, now hackers can afford to look at the data because they couldn't afford to do it before. And so this is the beginning, um, one part of the beginning of the revolution. Uh, and, and, and the holy grail, some people say, of all of this really, would be to, just to rewrite human code to slow down aging. So, you know, there's scientists like Dr. Cynthia Kenya, uh, Kenyon, who um, was at UCSF and, and now uh, is working for Google's Calico uh, life extension company, um, who has managed to slow down aging in worms. And when she, uh, when she did some tweaks to their uh, insulin pathways, she managed to allow worms to live six times longer than they would normally live. But they didn't live just six times longer. They, in a decrepit state or an old state, they lived six times longer in a young state. And she was very excited about this because it proved to her and a, a number of her colleagues that aging is plastic. Aging is not set in stone. Aging can be changed and slowed. Um, and there might be multiple ways to do it. She, um, thinks that she's got one of those ways, and uh, you know, I hope I hope that she's right. Um, but you know, we won't be doing that tomorrow. So what do we have in the meantime? We have things like tissue engineering, which maybe that's the low-hanging fruit these days, um, and some and some of the other things that you know the researchers on stage were just talking about. I mean, five, ten years out, that's low-hanging fruit, right? I mean, that's in the near term. Uh, Doris Taylor isn't here today, but she was one of the competitors, and uh, she, I'm excited by her work and a, and a lot of um, the scientists in her field who are manage, managing to grow human organs out of a person's own stem cells, so that you can essentially replace parts on a human being like you replace parts on a car in order to allow you know, people to live longer and healthier um, for, for longer periods of time. Okay, so that's all the technology part and the history part. The rest of my book was about how does that change the world? I mean, what does it really mean? And um, wealth gains uh, is one of the, the, the strongest areas. Economists have been looking at this for a long, long time. And the correlation between longevity and health gains, um, longevity, health gains, and economic growth is incredibly strong. And you can, you can see some of the numbers here for what it's worth to people. Um, there was a study that was done by a, a, a pair of researchers, one at Harvard and one Queen's University, that showed if you had two countries that were roughly sort of had same, similar economies, um, it's just that one country had a five-year advantage in life expectancy, only five years, their economy would grow 0.5% faster than the other economy. Now that's actually a huge amount. And you can imagine, I mean, maybe it doesn't go on a linear basis, but what if a country had a 10-year advantage, a 20-year advantage, a 30-year advantage? How does that affect international competitiveness and, uh, and economics? It's a big deal. So we should be wealthier as, as we can live for longer periods of time. Uh, innovation, this is why I have this up here. You know, being in Silicon Valley, I think a lot of people you know, we see all of these companies that are formed by 20-year-olds, right? 20-somethings. I mean, Google, Apple, all of these big companies. Facebook, right? How old was Mark Zuckerberg? 20-something uh, when, he, when he started Facebook. Um, but that's actually not the typical trend. Innovation, uh, according to scholars who study this area, innovation tends to peak around 40 years. Um, and, you know, maybe one of the theories for why that happens is by the time you hit 40 years old, you've had enough time to look at all different areas and pull together one insight from here and put it together from another area here and, and create something new. And maybe that's why innovation peaks around 40. And then, of course, 40 is when health starts to deteriorate for some people, right? And so maybe if you could keep, um, you know, people in, in better health for a longer period of time, maybe innovation would keep peaking. It, it would stay up there. It wouldn't just drop off at 40. You can see here that um, Da Vinci painted the Mona Lisa at 51. For ben Franklin kept innovating into, uh, into his late 70s, right? So, so it's possible as long as you have health, and that's the big deal here, is, is how do we get health? 
education. Um, this is just a, a, a small chart showing um, how uh, high school education has increased over time uh, with, with longevity. And it's not just that society has become wealthier and we can afford to put our kids in school and that the, econom the economy has changed from sort of an agrarian one to a more um, information-based one. It's also that the longer that you're alive, the more incentive you actually have to get more education because the, the more education you have, uh, the, the more money you tend to make. And so um, if you can get more education, then you have a longer period of time if you can live a longer period of time, to make money. And so there's, there's an incentive to get more education as you live longer. And of course, if you could live to 150 years old, you probably wouldn't want to stay in the same career that entire time. I think it'd be kind of fun to switch it up and change around. You could be a doctor, you could be a lawyer, and then you could be an entrepreneur. And you actually could do all of those things really, really well and detailed um, with, with a life expectancy of 150 years. So marriage. Uh, people have been getting married later and later uh, as, as longevity has gone up. When I was originally doing my book tour, I remember a uh, journalist sort of taking a look at these numbers and saying, well, you know, longevity has really popped up, but the age at first marriage, ha it's jumped, but not quite as much as you would expect, and I wonder why. And, you know, the answer I gave him is fertility. I mean, there's still a biological clock ticking, and fertility basically tanks by the time somebody's 50. By the time a woman's 50, um, of course, men can keep having children uh, later. But we're also learning that that's not necessarily all that good either. So, um, so the question is: Is will, will fertility technologies continue to improve? And I think the answer is yes. And when that happens, you know, today we're in the era of the 40-year-old mom. We might be in the era of the 70-year-old mom at some point if individuals can be kept healthier for longer periods of time, not just living longer, but being healthier. And that will change a lot too. Families will look a lot different. Um, there'll be a lot more diversity in, uh, in family trees. Religion, uh, this was one of the questions that surprised me the most when I first dug into the data. I expected that as, so as society became more advanced and more scientific, that religion would sort of wither away. But that's not at all what I found in the data and it surprised me and I actually spent a lot of time uh, looking at, check, double checking the data, triple checking the data, talking with uh, scholars of religion. And, um, you know, one of them pointed out to me at, at one point that, you know, look, um, the reason why religion probably won't wither away as we can live longer lives is that a big part of religion is in helping people learn how to live their life, right? It's not just about the afterlife. It's about how do you live the good life. So you could actually make the argument that as you have more life, you need more guidance, and therefore religion is actually quite important. Um, and it really depends on which religion and how they're focused, if they're focused on the afterlife or if they're focused on, on how do you live your life. And the religions that focus on how to live your life will probably uh, do extremely well in the future. Population is one of the first questions I think that springs to most people's minds when they think about longevity. They think, wow, if most people could live to 150 years, wouldn't population just spiral out of control? Um, and so when I dug into this, I found a really cool study from the, uh, some researchers at the University of Chicago who had looked at this question in actually a much more radical way. They said, look, uh, let's take the, the country of Sweden. If the entire country of Sweden were to become immortal tomorrow, not live to 150 years, but immortal, that means nobody dies from accidents, nobody dies from anything actually, everybody just lives forever. What would happen to the population of that country over the next 100 years? So they took all the data, plugged it into the various you know, World Bank, um, UN models, and the answer is a little bit surprising because you, you would think it would be higher. So over, the, over 100 years, if Sweden's population were immortal, population would, growth, pop, population would only grow by 22%. Which is, you know, that's some growth, but it's decent growth, but it's not nearly as big as you would expect it to be. Um, and when I asked them why, they said, look, heavy population growth doesn't come from fewer deaths. It comes from more births. Population growth is driven by fertility rates, not by death rates. And the reason for that is when one person doesn't die, it's only one person. But when you have um, you know, people having children, they get one, two, three, four, five, it's exponential, right? So one is exponential, one is not. And, and that's the reason why 
you know, we, we might be concerned about population, uh, although, you, as you can see, um, uh, rates are declining at the moment. Uh, it, you know, it might not be as big of a deal as you might think um, in, the, in the first place. What I think might be a big deal is uh, equality. And so this is, uh, this is a chart. So this, these are the, you can't see this under here, but these are the top 10 countries uh, for life expectancy. Monaco's at, at the top. Um, and then we've got uh, Macau and Japan, Singapore. Uh, Monaco's uh, at almost 90 years. So life expectancy in Monaco is 90 years. So we had some people on the stage here saying maybe we could live to 100 years, right? That's only a decade. I, I actually think that's really conservative. <laughs> uh, but, you know, in the next five years, if you pop it up to 100, that's pretty good. So these, this is the good news for those countries. The bad news, these are the bottom 10 countries. Look at that. Chad's down at 49.07. So Chad's at 49. Monaco's at 89. That's a 40-year gap. That's how old I am. I am the gap between those two countries. I mean, that, that's huge, right? And I don't think most people are thinking about this now, but when we have some of... Uh, these countries living to be, you know, on average 150, and then these countries are still down in the 50, 60 range, then people might start taking notice. And we might have some huge problems. And not just on the international scale, by the way, within our own country, there's big divides. I mean, the, the highest life expectancy that I found when I was looking through all the county data, um, and it's hard to do because there's a lot of data out there, um, uh, the highest life expectancy I found was an Asian American woman in New Jersey has a life expectancy of 91 years. Not bad, right? The lowest life expectancy I found in the US um, is a Native American man in North Dakota at 58 years. So 58, 91, 33-year gap. That's pretty big. And so within our own country, we could see that gap grow pretty large. And so the question is, you know, obviously the wealthy are always going to get the technology first. But the question is, is will there be a long time lag between the wealthy getting it and then the poor getting it, right? If there's not that much of a time lag and the, and the lo and longevity technology spreads out really quickly, then there probably won't be that much of a problem and everyone will catch up pretty quickly. But what if there's a really big time lag and longevity technologies are really expensive in the beginning and, and there's a really long time and, and you know, you have some really long-lived people and some short-lived people, there could be civil war. I mean, this is something people could literally fight for their lives for, right? So that... That's a potential problem. Um, you know, the optimists look at this and they say, well, look, to the extent that biology is now an information technology, maybe it's moving along this um, trajectory where uh, information technologies are, are distributing at, a, at an increasing pace. And if that's the case, then, then that's good news. But, you know, sometimes biology kind of looks stuck in the past and there's a lot of baggage. And it's not clear to me, actually, which way this is going to go. And so I, I, I think that this is a potential problem. So the last thing I will end with, because I know I'm standing between you and uh, some cool music and stuff, is what I think is the most important slide, actually, in my presentation. And I don't think probably anyone in this room fits into this group. Um, but we can't be complacent about this. You know, I, sometimes I hear people talking about longevity technologies, and they're like, oh, yes, of course it's going to happen, and we're all going to live for a long time, and it's going to be great. Don't worry about it. No, actually, we do need to worry about it. And we all need to put in effort right now, because if we don't worry about it, we're not going to benefit from it. I mean, I look at this and I think, you know, okay, I'm 42. I just had a birthday yesterday, actually. Um, you know, I could be in the last generation to live to only around 80 years, right? But I don't want that. I want to be in the next generation, sort of the first generation that gets to live to 150 years or more. But that's not going to happen unless we actually put in the effort and work really hard. And that's why I think what June is doing and a lot of the people in this room, actually I see Aubrey de Grey here from SENS and, um, and Christine Peterson. And you know, there's a lot of, and Ryan, actually there's many, many people here who are doing great work in, in the longevity field. Um, we have to work hard because if we don't, it's not going to happen. So I guess I'll just end with that. Thank you.